Hello, and welcome to this edition of Secure Networks, the index packet forensic files with your host, Michael Morris. This week's very special guest is Ron Ross, NIST fellow. Ron, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Oh, thanks, Michael. It's great to be with you today. Uh, yeah, my name is Ron Ross. I'm from NIST. I've been at NIST. Uh, it's going to be almost 25 years. I, it's hard to believe it's been that long. Yeah. <clears throat> and I I came to NIST in 1997 after a, a, a short stint in the private sector uh, where I worked for the Institute for Defense Analysis. It was a government think tank working on cybersecurity issues. And before that, I spent 20 years in the United States Army, uh, Army officer. And uh, I've uh, so I'm really on my, four, my, my third career now. And I'm, I, I love cybersecurity. And I think most people that know me, I have a passion for it. And there's just so many interesting things happening today. And I appreciate uh, taking the time today to, to be able to share some of those with you. No, we certainly really appreciate it. And thank you for your service. So where I kind of want to start, uh, obviously, um, a lot happening in cybersecurity landscape. But let's start with really, how are cybersecurity standards evolving with some of the modern threat challenges? Yeah, you know, I get that. That's a very interesting question. It's one. It's a very common question. I think when you have perspective, I, I go back. Uh, I can recall when cybersecurity first started. I think it was. It's been over forty to forty-five years ago. I think nineteen nineteen seventy-six with the Anderson Report, and of course uh, the technology has evolved so dramatically. Even in the last five to ten years, when you see the smartphones and the tablets and and the the supercomputers and and how we're able to do such phenomenal things with the technology. And so all of that has given us a very complex uh, systems environment of, uh, you know, literally trillions of lines of code and billions of devices and everything's connected over 4G, soon to be 5G, actually now 5G networks. And so the standards and guidelines <clears throat> that have emerged over the past uh, uh, decades have had to evolve with the technology. And, and so you're seeing uh, especially now with some of the newer NIST standards and guidelines, we're trying to recognize the complex environment that we're working in. And you couple that with the uh, increase in capabilities from adversaries. Uh, adversaries now are highly capable. They're well-resourced, especially right. the nation state level adversaries. Uh, they come with the best technology to attack our systems. And now they have access to some of the best attack tools through some compromises that have happened over the last uh, uh, several years, they, they get access to the best attack tools. And so it's not just nation state adversaries or terrorist groups. Mm -hmm. It's now individuals, anybody who has enough money to go to the dark web and purchase these attack tools. We basically enable the globe to do destruction, destructive acts on our, our mm -hmm. systems and our infrastructure. And so our standards and guidelines <clears throat> have had to evolve to meet that challenge. Yeah, it's funny. I, I saw something about ransomware for hire the other day, an article about it. I'm just yeah. like, where things have evolved to, it's crazy. So where do you see most organizations falling short in meeting these newer evolving standards? And, and what's your recommendation where their highest priority should be? Well, the, the, it's a very complicated question in some regard, because I think, first of all, we're being overwhelmed by technology. Uh, we, yeah. we love the technology. We're actually addicted to the technology and it, it's made us more productive and we're using it to the maximum extent. But with all that new technology, it, it brings in this notion of complexity. And what complexity translates to for, for customers is attack surface. It, yeah. The adversaries have been empowered now to attacks in so many new ways. So I think you have to almost go back to the, I call it the basic blocking and tackling of cybersecurity. Yes. Uh, any good football team, they spend their first two weeks in those two-a-day sessions learning how, how to do the basics, blocking and tackling. And then over time, you, ref you refine that to get your game plan, and, and do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. But I think the most important thing that any organization can do, and which most organizations are not doing now because they want the technology and they're expanding so rapidly, you have to have really great discipline in simplifying your information technology infrastructure, your, your systems, your applications. We have way too many things we have to deal with. And, and when you come down to it, you really get, want to get back to some of the fundamentals, um, least functionality, least privilege. You only want to have the ports, protocols, functions, applications, and, and system components that you actually need to carry out your critical missions and business operations. Mm -hmm. Everything else should be eliminated from the environment. And, and that's important because you have to try to manage that complexity. Because if we can't get our arms around that, then we're dealing with an environment that we just can't understand. 
And so I think that's the thing I would recommend. The highest priority is to simplify. I call it the great house cleaning of your, your, your infrastructure. You go through the closet and get rid of all the things you haven't worn in three or four years. You really have to be disciplined to get rid of all of the things that you don't use or are not mission essential. And once you do that, then whatever is left, that's where you start to organize your enterprise architecture, your security architecture. And we can talk a little bit more about how, how organizations can, can do some really fundamental and important things that don't cost a lot of money, but they're very critical to uh, getting control of your, your in information technology environment. Mm, that's tremendous insight. Simplify. I I've always been a, a big fan of the KISS principle, right? Keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that, that was what, that was our mantra in the military for 20 years that we always used to say that. <laughs> yeah. Keep it yeah. simple. So one of the things we're hearing a lot about, uh, from my perspective, is a lot of concern and threats against operational technologies. Right. And there, that's a wide, wide bucket in itself. But a lot of security vendors are really trying to address the OT issues. Are, are there new standards or recommendations specifically to address OT security? Um, and what are you seeing across the industry as it relates to operational technologies and operational threats? Well, the, the operational technologies, and, and of course, the, the biggest one that comes to mind are industrial control systems that are, right. that are controlling the grid and things like that, because the, the electric sector uh, is one of our critical infrastructure sectors, but is maybe it's one of the most important, because without energy and power, nothing else happens. So we're very concerned about that. I, I think... Uh, the, over the years, there's been a really bright line between information technologies, those would be the general purpose systems to run the business applications and all of that, and the other side of the house, which would be the operational technologies, the power plant, the grid operations, mm -hmm. and all of that. And those industrial control systems, they were, uh, they were built for real-time operations. And, and originally, they were not designed uh, to protect against some of these cyber threats, and they weren't really a problem back in the day because right. the, the, the OT systems weren't connected to the IT systems. Okay. And now you're seeing more and more with the advancing technology, those, those, those air gaps now are gone in many cases, and you have that bleed over so the attack vectors can come from one side to the other. Uh, we published uh, a long time ago, our first uh, publication, it was the NIST 800-82. It was uh, called Industrial Control System Security. And that publication is being updated as we speak, and they're coming out. I think it's revision three, okay. and they're actually going to be changing the name to operational technologies to show it's not just ICS as we're concerned about. It's more of the broad uh, operational technology, which can include, you know, building management control systems and all mm -hmm. the things, manufacturing systems, all those real-time process control systems that we we deal with in that side of the house. The the good news is that. Um, we're talking about computers at the end of the day. Uh, even the ICSs that were largely analog uh, years ago are now moving, moving to more digital technology. So the computer driven by firmware and software is still the essence of the problem for all these different types of systems, whether they're ICSs or whether they're the business systems. Now you do have to uh, account for how those systems operate, the real-time nature. Right. And so uh, the fundamental concepts of cybersecurity uh, can be applied to OT environments as well as IT. And we'll be reflecting some of those in the update to 800-82. Uh, the other thing, which I think we're going to talk about a little bit later, is uh, we have a, a couple of engineering guidelines that we're working on updating as well. And there are specific updates to those publications that deal with operational technologies okay. and the attack vectors, the tactics, techniques, and procedures that the adversaries use. And, and so we have a lot of guidance coming out that can help customers protect their systems on the OT side, as well as the traditional IT side. Okay, excellent. Well, we'll be looking forward to those new new updates. Speaking of that, you, you Ron, have a number of publications around uh, system security engineering. You, you kind of mentioned it there. Uh, and building trustworthy, secure systems. Tell us what that means and what you're encouraging organizations to do. And really, why is that so important? I think when we've looked at our history of cybersecurity over the last 40 years, uh, I think I characterize it as it's more of a one-dimensional protection strategy. We've always tried to stop bad guys on the outside to keep them from getting inside at the, at, the, at the perimeter. And I think what we've discovered over the years is no matter how hard we work with all the frameworks and the controls and the security programs and the SOCs, all the things that we do, there's a percentage of those cyber attacks that are gonna get through and penetrate your best defenses. Mm -hmm. 
And then the question becomes, what do you do then? So we talk about trustworthy, secure systems. I use the analogy of above the waterline and below the waterline. Okay. I think most of the work that we've done up to this point, largely it's been above the waterline. It's what customers can see. You put in your firewalls, uh, you, you, you do full disk encryption maybe, uh, you, you do all access control, two-factor authentication, and, and you, you do the best you can to deploy those safeguards and countermeasures that can stop the bad guys at the front door. But below the waterline, you know, we talked about before, that's where we see the systems, the, the system elements, the complexity, the hardware, the software, the firmware. And all of that is where the adversary has learned how to take advantage of our weaknesses. Those, those are largely fixed by architecture and engineering below the waterline. Yeah. And so one of the things we're trying to do in this is to say, we need to have a multi-dimensional protection strategy. Mm -hmm. We still want to do the basic blocking and tackling, try to stop at the front door, but let's make an assumption. And this is what our, our cyber resiliency guideline, 8160 volume two uh, has is its fundamental assumption. We assume the adversaries have gotten in, did everything you could, but they got in. Now, what do you do? Well, we, we're trying to talk about additional dimensions. The second dimension of security after you, you have penetration resistance and you do everything you can at the front would be to limit the damage the adversaries can do once they're inside. And then the third dimension, which we're trying to define as part of the engineering work is making your systems more cyber resilient or system resilient. So you have that, you, you can take the punch and, and it, you don't go down for the count. The system can continue to operate even if, if it's in a degraded or debilitated state. And so that's the whole nature. How do you build systems? We call it secure by design. You, you can never mm -hmm. add security in at the end because a lot of the things below the waterline we're talking about are mm -hmm. part of fundamental engineering. Uh, you engineer systems, just like for safety, you engineer systems for security. It's a, it's a property that emerges from that system based on good uh, application of secure mm -hmm. design principles and the engineering process. And so that's the direction we're, we're trying to head to so that we can have systems that operate a little more like the human body. We have a great immune system and about 99.9% .9 of the time, our immune system is going to take care of business. Occasionally, the immune system gets overwhelmed, right. uh, COVID, you know, cancer, things like that. But for the most part, we, we need systems that are not as brittle so they can, they can uh, absorb those attacks and deal with those. No, that's that's excellent insights on that. And actually, it leads to kind of my next question, which is consistent. I've had the fortune of talking with a number of CISOs over the last several months about shifting their security team's mindset from this concept of prevention of attacks to building cyber resiliency into their organization. I think so. To your point, I think CISOs are seeing that, right? They've got to build resiliency in. So tell me your thoughts on 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 that concept from a CISO's perspective and where you really think organizations should start? Well, I think uh, it, it, it has to do with, with the mindset of the above the waterline, below the waterline. Right. We continue, if you're a CISO, you still wanna do all the, the basics that you've been doing. We, we've made a lot of progress though. We're actually doing pretty well in that whole area with the controls and the frameworks and the awareness of what has to be done. But I think turning at least half or more of your attention below the waterline, right. which means we talked about earlier, um, doing a complete inventory of hardware and software and eliminating all the unnecessary things that you don't, don't mm -hmm. need for mission essential activities. And then focus on the architecture. For example, we have access controls and identification, authentication controls, two-factor, all of those controls are applied. But where you apply those controls in the network as part of the architecture makes a real difference. So, for example, you're hearing a lot about the concept of zero trust concepts yes. and zero trust architectures. Well, if you can imagine, the analogy I use there is your house. You have a lock on the front door of your house, but sometimes the bad guys break through the lock and they come into the house. If they're in the house and they can go through every room in your house and steal all your valuables, well, that's not a good thing. Right. But what if the house was designed so once they come in the house, every room in your house had a vault or a safe in that room? So what you're doing now is you're, you're increasing their work factor. They've gotten in the front door, but they got to get through every one of those secondary defenses. Those are right. kind of individual we call security domains. Now, you can still apply the same access control mechanisms and authentication authorization mechanisms to those smaller and smaller pieces. So instead of just doing it once around the perimeter, you're now applying those to smaller resources. Right. And therefore the adversary has to get through every one of those successive barriers. 
What does that do? That increases their work factor. Uh, and, and we can combine that with a lot of the new virtualization techniques, including mm-hmm. micro virtualization, where you can refresh those components so rapidly that even if malicious code gets in to any component, if your refresh is quick enough to bring it back to a known secure state, then they don't have enough time on target to do damage. Yeah. So when we talk about damage limitation in our second dimension, we're talking about those two different, I call it a horizontal and a vertical. You, you, you have... You, you try to um, decrease their lateral movement across your system by making increasing the work factor. And at the same time, you decrease their time on target with virtualization, combining those two segmentation, micro segmentation, virtualization. It really makes their environment very unpredictable once they're inside. And that confusion, and it, that, that's great for us. And it makes the adversary's job a lot more difficult. And that's one of the ways that we think we can make these systems more, or more, more resilient. Oh, that's, that's really interesting. And I love the, the house analogy. That's uh, every room becomes a safe room, so to speak. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. So to, to that point, we know we should be engineering for the defense possible. Um, however, as you mentioned, you know, there's always going to be gaps and holes due to human error, supply chain compromises, you know, outside factors, unpatched vulnerabilities, et cetera, even insiders. Right. Um, so, but we know that SOC teams are overwhelmed with with incidents to triage. So what are your thoughts about applying systems engineering to SOC SOC incident response teams and their processes? Right. Well, the the SOCs and the incident response teams play a very critical role. This is not about any one component being a silver bullet. This is about a multi-dimensional strategy Mm -hmm. with lots of different components to it. And it really is the essence of what we call defense in depth, which we talked about for years. Right. But when you start with a good architectural focus that we talked about earlier, um, you're building a solid foundation. In other words, you're building a, a foundation of concrete instead of with wooden termites that are kind of eating the underpinning of the house. Now, I've always thought that all the things that we do, all the technologies on scanning and all the we, we've had some tremendous uh, technological advances in scanning technologies, machine learning, artificial intelligence. So even though we're gathering a lot of data, we're able to process that data and analyze it much more quickly Mm -hmm. and be a lot smarter about what we're seeing. So I think these things work together. You increase the strength of the foundation and it makes the the scanning part of the process and the Mm -hmm. things that are done above the waterline where where the SOC works, it makes that much more efficient and more effective. And so I think this is not an either or, I think that one complements the other. Uh, so deep packet inspections and all the things that we do in the scanning world, those things are really important uh, because, as we said earlier, the adversaries are going to get in. So right. while we're making their job more difficult with lateral movement, increasing the work factor, and maybe uh, keeping the target time to a minimum, if you combine that with good scanning technologies and, and our ability to gather and analyze data, now you're starting to get the upper hand on the adversary. And I think that is going to be the ticket to success long term. No, that's that's tremendous insights. Um, so one thing I always like to ask our, our guests on our podcast series here is be a prognosticator for a second. What do you recommend? What's the one thing you recommend to our listeners or our viewers to really think about or watch out for over the next six to 18 months? And I know that's an eternity in cybersecurity space, but uh, if, if you were really trying to highlight something important, what, what would that be? Yeah, it's, it's kind of a tough question because there's so many things that overwhelm. I, I, I work with a lot of uh, cybersecurity people. Obviously, it's right. the, the fundamental thing we do. But I, I think people get overwhelmed very easily now. You know, being a CISO and, and just having to worry about cybersecurity can be overwhelming. And so I, I like to say, hey, let's, let's to break this thing down into manageable pieces. Uh, I think we shouldn't be obsessing over the threat space that much. We, we tend to do that a lot. We look at the threat constantly. But, you know, you're never going to be able to predict the next cyber attack, the next type of threat coming out. It's an impossible task because there's so many and they're expanding almost exponentially. So I like to focus on the defense, uh, focus on building the architecture. Start with a simple plan, uh, like we talked about housekeeping, getting rid yeah. of stuff and, and simplifying. And then uh, relook at your enterprise architecture. That's where everything starts because Systems don't live in isolation. Most enterprises have multiple systems, hundreds and maybe thousands of components. And looking at all those in the totality of, a, of, a, of an enterprise architecture, 
and then building your security architecture underneath that. Uh, and I, the other thing I would say is that I, I would really be cautious on getting overwhelmed by um, the, as happens with every new technology, every new concept, like zero trust, there can be a lot of things that they are hyped up about these different things. Like we saw with cloud computing, we had to have several years before cloud sorted itself out and became kind of a standardized uh, technology now. Same thing with zero trust. Zero trust has been around probably over a decade or more with John sure. Kinderbeg's work, uh, but now it's the hot topic. So you're gonna have a lot of people come in and say, hey, I got a zero trust solution for you and it's gonna be to solve all your problems. Right. Nothing is gonna solve all your problems. And you have to be, take a step back, um, look at things from a very fundamental standpoint. Um, you know, don't be too quick to uh, buy a new technology. You have to really sort through all the, all the marketing and, and see what it really offers for your particular organization. There are so many great tools out there and, and, and technologies that our, our great industry produces. And, and sometimes we can get overwhelmed with too many tools and too many technologies. And it just, as you said before, with the SOC, they can get overwhelmed with information. Right. We can get overwhelmed with tools. So I would just say, to, you know, be cautious. Uh, don't take forever to make decisions, but um, take a look at how is it can help my organization. What can I do to simplify? Uh, that's not going to break the bank because we all have limited budgets and it becomes a return on investment. How much am I going to spend to protect my critical assets? And is that really worth it for my organization? A lot of things you can do do not cost an arm and a leg to, to uh, bring into an organization. And, uh, and I think that's what I would do. Just just take a, take a deep breath and not get overwhelmed with some of the new spin that's coming out with some of these new technologies that are no, being purported. That, that's an excellent point. And, and I've heard repeatedly now, and you're nailing it again, um, you know, tools are only one, one leg of the stool, right? You've got people and you've got processes around those tools exactly. uh, that, that you really got to make sure are all integrated to, to have a comprehensive security plan. So, Ron, thank you for taking a little bit of time to, to share your insights with us in how to better secure networks. We'd ask our listeners to tune in next time for another edition of the Endace Packet Forensic Files. For more information about Endace's network packet capture platform and our integrations with our fusion technology partners, please go to endace.com. Ron, again, thanks for taking some time and have a great day. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate it.